try to be thoroughly honest, simple, and objective. I have the Bible here. I have the Bible. I won't even say I have the Holy Ghost right now because you can't see that, but I have the Bible. Everybody see my Bible? What's that? That's the word of the Lord, isn't it? Will that profit us? It certainly will. Hallelujah. I think I'll open my Bible to the 11th chapter of Hebrews for a moment for a short <clears throat> exordium. <coughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in a 32nd verse. And the writer of Hebrews here has penned for us, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and, of, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Quite a list, isn't it? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. It's amazing how the word shows its power at times. You read something and it just crackles, doesn't it? It indicates it wants to explode in, in our life or our generation. And this writer said he didn't have time to, to uh, give a, a Holy Ghost interpretation of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and others. He had given us some wonderful ones. But uh, this morning, I'm going to take the time he didn't have and talk about Samson. Hallelujah. We have time this morning, don't we? Amen. 13th chapter of Judges. Somebody done dug a well and it's right under the pulpit here. <laughs> oh, <there. laughs> I also see a bottle of oil. Hallelujah. Oil and water under the pulpit. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it, Sister Cunningham? <laughs> How many appreciate having felt the presence of the Lord, of the living God in these meetings? I'm always looking and watching for the word God quickens in. As our two sisters spoke, uh, I believe, moved by the Holy Ghost, I, I felt, I felt uh, the witness of the Spirit inwardly. And uh, we're going to look at this uh, story of Samson in the book of the Judges. It is said that the book of Joshua is a book of victory and the book of Judges is a book of defeat. Uh, I notice there are two kinds of times with God's people. There are the up times, the upbeat times, the light times, times of revival, mountaintop, uh, having all manner of sensate reasons to glory and exult and revel and luxuriate in God. Now other times everything gets dark and it's down and uh, things are dim and Everything is held. We're stuck, it seems. And our story opens on a dark time. But the Bible says somewhere, darkness and light are both alike to God. <laughs> and I am becoming more and more interested in dark times. One of the reasons I'm living in one. I don't want to be living in a dark time and study all about light times. If it's going to be dark, I want to learn how to deal with the dark. I have perhaps foolishly gone into the Adirondacks and I think six times walked out of a mountain peak in the dark. I did it in, in the winter and in summer and I did it with and without a flashlight. And I found that uh, being about six miles back from the highway and being totally dark, <clears throat> in the wilderness and no human being within miles, it is amazing what power a little pocket flashlight takes on. Its voltage seems to 
uh, increase almost by a geometrical uh, amount. Just having that little can of daylight with you in the dark. And uh, I believe the Bible says somewhere that God's word sheds light on our pathway. Isn't that right? It's, it's a light on our pathway. And so uh, this is a dark time when our story opens. It's a time of defeat. And uh, I'm, I, I will say that God is speaking to me through uh, Samson's life at this time. Several weeks ago, God began to raise this all up in my being, stir it up and quicken it again and remind me of what I had received in the past, these four chapters. And suddenly God's voice is coming to me through the medium of Samson's biography. I, I find that the word never becomes so powerful as when it becomes personal. One, one thing that I have reasoned out is this. When Jesus came into the world, the, the world was full of scriptures. They had many scrolls. They had many priests. They had a high priest or two. Uh, they had the tradition of prophets. They had the law of Moses. And that word was lying there in a sort of state of dormancy. It wasn't really doing much except in a very small remnant, such as uh, Elizabeth, Zacharias, Mary, Joseph, Simeon, Anna, and a few humble people around Jerusalem and in Judea. But as soon as the Word made flesh walked into that situation, things suddenly began to crackle with revolutionary tension. The, the Word made flesh walked in. The personalized Word. You know, the Bible says all flesh is as grass and and it will, it's very, very transient, very temporary, and it passes away. But then the Bible says, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And the thing I see there is whosoever links himself consciously and willfully and gives diligence for a lifetime and links himself to the Lord, he also will be eternal as the word is. And so there's value in getting the word in our being. We are becoming, as it were, eternalized or immortalized as we receive his word. And James says it, Peter says it, Paul says it, the gospels say it. Hallelujah. I hope we uh, have at least one thing Luther and the Reformers had, I believe, we ought to have a high value on the word of the Lord. I see that spotlighted in the very beginning of this story here. And I want to go into my my first area of, of, of consciousness and emphasis in, in Samson's story here today, chapter 13 and verse 1, says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. History has not yet seen the end of the cycles where God's people and God's children do evil in his sight. There's no, there's no end in sight of that. I know there's a day coming. As brother, brother, uh, as our, our brother the priest last night said, Brother Roundtree, in days to come, there is a coming day when I thought this morning uh, there will be no more preaching. Preaching will be over for Jeremiah said, they shall no longer teach every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord, for they shall all know me from the great, least to the greatest. And that day, everything will give way to an eternity of praise and worship and divinely instigated and directed and blessed activity. And it's not going to be preaching and teaching. <laughs> but that day hasn't come yet, has it? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so... I'm here and I draw some comfort and I'm not here altogether at my own will. Praise the Lord. You know, in your Bible school, you may chafe and say, well, I don't want to be here. That means I don't will to be here. I, pancreas is hurting me somehow or something's hurting me and I'm uncomfortable and I'd like to flee to somewhere. I don't will to be here. Something that's been going on in my mind about generalities of Scripture is I'm comforting myself with the thought that God thought about me in eternity. God thought about you. You were in God's thoughts in eternity before there was an earth. God thought about you in eternity. 
And it comforts us to realize we're not here primarily because we have willed it. But someone higher and greater and invisible and eternal has willed it. And we have got caught in the, in the, in the, uh, the, the great dynamic flow of his will. And we're here. And we're beginning to understand and learn and accept. I feel like a helium filled balloon. I'm having a hard time getting down to this simple word. I want to get down. I need some lead weights to pull me down. I tend to sail up too readily and too easily. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And you all know what that might indicate. Forty years of, of uh, servitudes, forty years of bondage, forty years of slavery, forty years of being impoverished. One of the persistent, consistent, and repetitive teachings of the book of Judges is that disobedience leads to impoverishment. But Isaiah 119, Brother Wade Taylor's favorite scripture says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Amen. Hallelujah. And then in verse 2 we read, we go from the social and the general to the personal and the concrete. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bore not. May I just point out that he's a Danite and Dan means the judge. Also his Hebrew name Manoach means it has every idea attached to it that refers to peace, rest, comfort, security. You know, it makes us smart when we're under a word that refuses to come to pass, doesn't it? If anybody wrestled with a word that you couldn't make come to pass, it just wouldn't work. And here's Manoah having a name that means peace, rest, comfort, security. And there are two things wrong in his life. First, his nation is in slavery. Secondly, his wife is barren. He's cursed in generalities and he's cursed in particularities. And he feels it. They were very, very conscious of the curse in the Semitic cultures, especially the curse of barrenness. And yet he lives in the tribe of Dan, which means the judge. You know, one thing that I live for and, and uh, things that, uh, that utterly fascinate me and things that, are, that I am gripped by. One is, I'm going to say right now, I am impressed with the clarity of the divine mind. Let me point out in a, in a, a, a neat little scripture. I feel like somebody ought to say hallelujah in this place or even shout. It gets uncomfortable in the pulpit when the praise isn't released and makes it hard to do everything. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Hallelujah! <laughs> I, 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 I hope you know we have a Holy Ghost shout. And we need to fire off a round once in a while to just to clear the air. <clears throat> Talking about the clarity of God's thinking, of God's mind, of his consciousness, and not even doing justice to him in, in the way I'm phrasing it, but praying he'll forgive the sin of my sermon today. Luther repented of his prayers. I've had to do that because I found years ago I go and I teach God. My prayer closet becomes God's classroom and I go tell him all kinds of things he never knew before. <laughs> you know, the pastor goes, you know, Lord, Sister so-and-so ain't doing right. <laughs> She's upsetting the whole church. <laughs> Praying High tells in his uh, autobiography how he went to the mountains of India one time for a very necessary rest and vacation and found even there he couldn't quit praying. I suppose even prayer can become a habit. And so he went to God and began, he thought about a certain missionary who was very carnal. <laughs> I thought the other day some of us represent baptized carnality. 
We're in the church, we're baptized, we have Jesus, but we're carnality baptized. It was before unbaptized, now it's baptized. So praying I got before the throne of God, recited all this missionary's flaws and faults and supposed sins. And he said, while he was praying, a hand was pressed over his mouth. And God spoke and said, he that toucheth him, toucheth the apple of mine eye. And God said, from now on, when you come before me, tell me something good about him. <laughs> What's good about some of us? Well, we're, we're, we're people, we're humans, we're persons, we're God's children by creation. Secondarily, some of us God's children by new birth and redemption. We bear the divine image. Even the greatest murderer in the world is not all murderer. There's something else. Even psychotics have an inviolate personal center that whatever that evil force is has never yet touched. And I believe in this convention the, the urges of the Holy Ghost are to further persuade us to invite Jesus deeper into our beings that he might find that final throne in the heart of hearts and sit there, hallelujah, and subdue all his enemies. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God. He's a conquering. He's not giving up like we are in the charismatic movement or your church or Pinecrest or you personally. He's not giving up. If we all give up and lie down and, and, and pull the dirt on top of ourselves, he will raise up another people who will be willing to become mighty. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says in St. John 6 and 5, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he saith unto Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this Jesus said to test Philip, for Jesus himself knew what Jesus would do. <laughs> we can go before God and say, God, I'm confused, but you're not confused. <laughs> Hallelujah. Talking about the clarity of the divine mind. Now, I see the Israelites and Manoah suffering under, under judgment, but not God's judgment. Or God has given them up to this judgment, let us say. The Bible plainly states God gave them up. God has permitted this. But I see the judgment of the Philistines ruling and having dominion. And isn't it interesting? It was the Hebrews who had scriptures that spoke about dominion. We know from the Bible, and that part that was already written when, when Samson lived, that it was God's will for his faithful people to have dominion. This, I am sure the Philistines had no scriptures that spoke about dominion. I'm sure that is an idea peculiar to the genius of the authentic, divine, revealed religion. It talks about dominion. But here they are under the dominion of another group or a superior technologically. I call that the judgment of the cosmos, that impersonal, horrifying, un unloving, depersonalizing, death-dealing judgment of the cosmos itself, or a social and a historical judgment, Israel, God's people, are just now under the Philistines. And if you would have been in Israel, you couldn't have felt God witnessing to that. You couldn't have felt an affirmation. You wouldn't have known it was God's will. All you'd have known was utter oppression and misery and death. Mrs. Minot is barren. She's under a cosmic judgment. She is suffering the effects of chemical determinism. Things have not been right, and she has not produced any babies. And it may be chemical in origin, but it results in spiritual agony so great that a woman called Hannah could express it and move God upon his throne. She prayed a prayer of quality that moved God. I'm just trying to sort of paint a picture here. And I want to go to verse 3 now. It speaks of divine intervention. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman. And said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not. But thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. 
Boy, it's something to bear a son that's been talked about from the throne of God, isn't it? A son that bears a heavenly mark. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazareth unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now in this King James, or in this modified King James Version, I notice the angel of the Lord spoke 78 words. And I know in the original Hebrew there would be a percentage less. I don't know how many less, but if he spoke 78 in the English translation, it was less in Hebrew, 50 or 60 maybe, maybe 40. Because that's the way those two languages are. It takes more English words to translate Hebrew than the Hebrew originally had. Is that right, Brother Hoyer? That's always consistently true, isn't it? And so the angel came down and said perhaps 60 words. And with 60 words, he has overturned the social and historical judgment on Israel, and he has overturned the cosmic judgment against Mrs. Manoah. He has spoken less than 100 words, and he has uh, torn out of reality evil judgments, and he has spoken into the situation the personal, loving, gracious, redemptive judgment of God. Hallelujah. It is revealed that this situation of bondage is not according to heaven's will. And this situation is not God's best. And it is not God's will for her to be barren. And the angel comes and says, 60 short words. And has reversed everything. Hallelujah. I am impressed with the smallness with the statistical smallness and meagerness and humbleness of heaven's utterances, and yet how power-packed these words are. These words will overturn the existing situation. The whole uh, situation that has been is going to be reversed now. Israel's bondage is over, though the nation doesn't know it, because heaven has spoken. The throne has given utterance into the situation. Hallelujah. Mrs. Manoah's barrenness is over, and it's not just over in that the angel could have said, now you're going to bear a mediocre son, but even a mediocre son is sufficient to thrill a woman. But this angel says that he shall be a divine genius of a heavenly order, hallelujah, and he shall begin to break the dominion of the Philistines. Glory be to God, hallelujah. I say there's something that wants to burst forth out of all this. I've been impressed with all these divine visitations and how little the angel said, how little God said. Jesus appears to Paul or Saul on the road to him, how little he says. He usually says 50 to 100 words or 150 or so. I want to tell you, I don't have any desire to have a notebook full of prophecies in my house that builds up sheet after sheet after sheet. What I want is one single, solitary, small word right out of the mouth of God. And to be honest with you, I have to say I received it years ago and I have it and I'm under it this morning. Hallelujah. And I don't see any reason why I should search any farther. How many have Jesus in here? Well, in a sense, you've come to the rainbow's end. It's how to unfold it, how to express it. I'm not seeking for a further savior or another person or another God or another word. To have one single solitary small power packed word and live under the impact of it for a lifetime. I tell you, on one tank of fuel you'll go to the end and that victoriously. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And I don't believe the angel had to wax rhetorical or, or get even as excited. I believe he could come in and speak with the utmost suavity. And he could be so reticent. And he could be so diffident. And, and just say, uh, behold now. Oh, Baron. 
and murmurest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. How can whisper it? It's an intrinsic quality. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. May I open my Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Glory be to God. I, I feel God. I, I thank and praise God for the solid scriptures that change not and for the present dynamic experience of the living God, being touched by God, touching God, feeling his love, being washed in the blood of Jesus, being able to go into the pulpit saying with C.H. Spurgeon, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, And I, brethren, when I came, and came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <clears throat> I have found in my case, one thing I've had to do over the years is change my mind a lot. Change of the mind has reference to repentance. How many know that? Repentance has to do um, with, among other things, changing your mind. And I used to think what Paul meant here was that he was saying to me, when I preached, though it wasn't eloquent, and though I was attacked by fits of nervousness, there were various signs, wonders, and miracles that happened that validated my word in contradistinction to other so-called self-appointed apostles. I have changed my mind about this. I now believe what Paul means when he says, uh, my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I believe he is talking about the quality of the word itself aside from any miracles. I believe it is a word that contains something within itself. As the angel Gabriel said to Mary, it contains the power of self-fulfillment. And when Elizabeth prophesied to Mary, she says, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things that were told her from the Lord. You know what this day needs? Not another preaching. We need a performance. Not the endless duplication and reduplication, iteration and reiteration, the multiplication of words, which only increases the burden of guilt when all is said and done. But there finally has to come a time when there is no more speaking. There has to be an act of God. Amen. Elizabeth said there shall be a performance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of our God. Hallelujah. Let me do some more in chapter 13. As we seek to be led through the old book by the Holy Spirit, who is the author standing behind it. The woman told her husband Manoah what happened and what was said. The angel saying, he, the child shall be a Nazarite. That means a specially separated person, specially holy person to God, set aside just for God's use, from the womb to the day of his death. And just to bring it a little practical and low and humble and something that's nice about the Lord, the Bible says Manoah entreated the Lord and said, oh my Lord, let the man of God whom thou didst send come again unto us. 
and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. I would say, man, your family done had one angel visitation. That's rare in history. Most people won't even dream of having, won't even dare to ask God for one. On your way. The Bible says, God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. He's the head of the family. He's the father. And how God, at the same time he's doing high and miraculous things, he's also maintaining some very, uh, very uh, unobtrusive orders in society. I just noticed that little thing there. How God observes this order. And the Bible says, God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. Isn't that nice? Hallelujah. And I noticed that when the angel spoke the first time, what he said was in harmony with Moses' writings. And when he came back the second time, he said the same thing he said the first time. One other thing I like about a word in my life, I like it to consistently all say and mean the same thing. But I don't have a prophecy that I'm to be an apostle, one I'm to be a teacher, one I'm to be a deacon, and one I'm to be a million dollar fundraiser of that new calling that wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> Pardon me. Somebody needs to stand up and mock these things and become indignant and tear the mask off of it. A Christianity that is devolved into fundraising has died. It's dead. In the realm of economics and number, which are death dealing realms, it's dead. God is the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He doesn't need human genius to stoke the furnace of the church with dollar bills, fives, tens, fifties, and hundreds. He knows how to send ravens with bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. Unclean birds. It's even outside of almost the law. But they're unclean birds. A strict construction must say, get on your way, ravens. You don't conform to my idealism. Anyway, that's, that's a, an aside and somewhat problematical of that. Let's go on and get down to the text here. One thing I want to say in a general way, uh, trying to say it simply, to me, this baby and these babies in the Bible that are born of barren women, to me they represent revival. They represent visitation and renewal. If you notice when they come, the angel gives spatial instructions of how to raise the child. In fact, Manoah asks specifically. Manoah says, uh, to the angel, how shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? I simply believe that the reason so many revivals have died is that they were not treated properly by the people who received them. I believe it is the normal Christian life and it is possible and it is God's will and it has been demonstrated that you can be alive all your life in God. You don't have to have a, a, a fantastic ignition period where you get zapped by a bolt of redemptive lightning from heaven and suddenly everything lights up. You live through a 5, 10, 15 year period of glory and revelation and satisfaction and joy and ecstasy. And then that gives way to a, a plodding, deadly duty for the rest of your life. I do not believe it has to be that way. I believe you could be alive all your life. I believe you can have a good marriage from, from, from the wedding until the last day. And I believe you can have a good life in God that is full of dynamic and is utterly and abundantly and overflowingly satisfying in God. And I believe the reason people lose them is they have mishandled and, and mistreated the marvelous thing God gave them from heaven. I believe that revival can be transcended. I believe there are some people in the world who are subject to revival. I believe it's another class who walk above it all. And if they have any relation to revival, they bring it. And they, do, they were developed in that capacity in those miserable, miserable, miserable dark valleys between revival. I am more interested in the in-between periods than I am the mountain peaks that are blazing with glory right now. 
Because it's in those dark periods, those nights, that God prepares his instrument. If you had to wait for glory to get prepared, you'd never get prepared because those glorious periods don't last that long. All they do is puzzle people. They don't know how to relate to them. But when you learn to know the living God personally, you can transcend revival, you can exceed revival, you can live in a heavenly dimension no matter what the rest of the church is doing. That's my doctrine. I believe it. And I believe if somebody dares to say amen, God will bless you for it. Hallelujah. It may take courage to even say amen sometimes. Now I said that and didn't say it well, but I said it and it's over now. But did you get a point or a part of a point or a glimmer or a hint or see a light flashing from a certain direction? Let me look at something else in chapter 13. Manoah said, I'm in verse 17 now, unto the angel of the Lord. What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? The Bible says in 16, Manoah did not know he was an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is too hard for thee? Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is wonderful? Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is a miracle? Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. Manoah wanted the whole religious development of all time compressed into a small bundle and handed to him. He wanted to understand all these things in the New Covenant and the book of Revelation and the end of time and everything. And the angel says, look, Manoah, just take what I'm giving you. It's not time for my name to be revealed yet. It's going to take generations of moral and ethical development before men can bear to hear my name. <laughs> Glory be to God! Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is an absolute miracle? <laughs> How is it we can all, some of us, sometimes in a lot of the church, mouth Jesus, 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 and there's nothing there. It's because that wonderful name has fallen out of the realm of revelation into a realm of mere information. But when God, the Holy Ghost, puts things back where they belong, it's still... You want to know what to pray? Ask God to reveal the name of Jesus to you. See what happens. So Manoah took a kid with a meal offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. The angel did miraculously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Aren't these old Bible stories marvelous? The power, the life, the infinite, riveting power to grip you. They have now received the word, and they don't need any further manifestations of that order. They have received the word. It's in here. They've grasped it. They believed it. The angel knows it's secured. He can go back now. But there's going to be a performance. Hallelujah. God help the Philistines once God has set his word in motion. 
It's like somebody up on the top of the mountain loosing a great boulder. <laughs> it's coming. It's too far away even to hear its rumble. But your days are numbered. Your kingdom is doomed. There's a great rock rolling down the mountain in your direction. God has come into the world and he has put his word in motion. Hallelujah. He has spoken into a believing heart, which is an explosive situation. Hallelujah! Glory be to God! Oh, hallelujah! I can say the whole worldly system is doomed for Jesus is rolling down the mountain. Hallelujah! Glory be to God! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You notice how in these Bible stories there's such utterly transcendent, lofty, ethereal, Things that are really too high, and then other things happen right down at the earthly plane. How a heavenly miracle and human generation are wrapped together in producing this boy, and God is not ashamed. Hallelujah, he affirms us in our fatherhood, our motherhood, our family living, our human-like aspirations, dreams, and desires. But in it all, God wants to have his way too. God wants his portion. Yes, he'll give the barren woman a child, but the child is also for God and his purpose. Hallelujah. 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 I want to deal with the last two verses in chapter 13 now. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, Shimshon, which means sunlight. It may be she was affectionately naming him Sonny, like my mother called me when I was three and four. It may be that because the sun is strong, Shimshon means strength. In the tropics, I found how strong the sun is. The sun, without smiting me suddenly like lightning, would flatten me every day. And I'd lie in my bed languishing all afternoon in the tropics. Because the sun is strong, it overcame me. I don't know exactly what her motive was, but at least the whole idea of light is in his name. Do you see it? Light. It's a dark time, and she gives him a name that's all full of light. You see, darkness begins to crumble and to, begins to uh, lessen and begins to flee away when a believing soul begins to speak a word of light. And the Bible says, the child grew and the Lord blessed him. <clears throat> And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. I want to talk a little bit about this movement, the movement of life. I just read a brilliant and masterly analysis of what's wrong with Western culture by Jacques Ellul, the French thinker, theologian, expert in economics and law. And he said, one of the great evils one can observe in our time is movement without direction. I know that there is a thought in many hearts here today and all over the land and all throughout the charismatic movement, all throughout the Church of Jesus Christ of every stripe and denomination, there is a tremendous concern about direction. Let's just be honest and consider how many in this room at this time have a very heartfelt concern about direction in your life and you need direction and you know it. How many? Just dare to give a testimony. <clears throat> I had a little bit of an insight this morning. It is important to realize, and I was glad when I heard Queen Helen last night refer to the Holy Ghost as he and him. For you're either, either going to conceive of the Holy Ghost as a blind force, as an ignorant power, or you're going to conceive of him as the person of the Godhead Amen. with the entire mind of God present and resident, and he is going to be gracious and very 
gentle and loving and kind and considerate. And I want to say this, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, the Holy Ghost has no confusion as to the direction he wants to go. You are never to be afraid to yield to the real Holy Spirit of God, for it will come out redemptively, it will be good, it will bless God, you, and everybody else involved. When the Holy Ghost comes on you, he has direction in mind. And Samson is beginning to experience a movement upon his person, even bodily, that is going to move him in a direction the earth nobody else is going, and that is God's direction of deliverance. Now, I began to understand some years before I came to Pinecrest, and I tell you, I've been a very stupid person, and God has had to work years for me to get some ideas through to my head or my mind or to my consciousness. One way to experience or to, to declare, one way to describe our, our life's quest is we are in search of an adequate idea. And for me, that has kind of resolved itself into grace, the grace of God, the wonderful grace of Jesus. But I began to understand, and I think perhaps Watchman Nee, and I've never read much of his stuff, but somewhere I think, perhaps through an utterance of Watchman Nee's, I got this. <clears throat> I probably never read more than one or two of his books in my whole life. But God moves us by external circumstances over which we have no control. No matter how much you fast, pray, and believe, and if you're the world's greatest faith expert, there's still something objective to you you have no power or control over. And that is found in the word Zora, which means stinging hornets. You think you're a masterful person? Wait till a whole hive of bees gets on you and see what you do. And also, when they come upon you, I cannot stop you and have a very calm, cold-blooded, rational discussion and say, Brother Jones, uh, exactly what is your direction? You will be moving, but you will not be conscious of a certain direction. <clears throat> now, I am a man who has been stung thousands of times at once by an entire hive of yellow jackets, which are a form of hornet, or a hornet's a form of yellow jacket. I was stung several thousand times when I was about six years old and uh, have had the antibodies of my body rather used up early and prematurely so that my last bee sting was a real big affair and I think had God not come on me I would have died of it. But the power of God went through me for many hours and my arm swelled up like that from a wasp sting so I don't know what shape I'm in more my body chemistry is at if I if I'm standing always at the borderline of death with the next one, or if God has changed it and he's restored it, I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> I can only speculate, but I had that experience. But God will move us by objective circumstances over which we have no control. And we might call them to personalize us and make it gracious, providential circumstances. And the other place name her eshtayal means please or entreaties or it can be expressed as prayer. God will move you by external circumstances beyond your control, beyond your carnal control, your rational control, and also by the deep inward desire that he kindles in you in this salvation. How many have seen and felt those two forces working in life? The Spirit of God, the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There are trees in this world that are very tall, three, over 350 feet tall, and science at one time felt that sap could never get to the top of those trees, and yet they knew it did, but there was no scientific basis for believing sap could rise to the top of a great redwood. Science has found a dual process whereby a push-pull takes sap beyond what scientific principle declares it should be able to. And I believe that by this dual process, God will get us where we can never go otherwise. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord's name today. 
Now let me give perhaps three moral lessons out of Samson here today. Let me give perhaps three little moral lessons. We all know how he turned out, and I am no waking through the four chapters today, but I want to I want to give three little moral lessons. And the first one is his name, Shimshon, means sunlight. And Samson had received a word from heaven by the mediation of an angel. And the word of the Lord is our light. And having a name of sunlight or, or sunny or whatever it was, but embodying the concept of light, having had that, Samson failed or refused to walk in his light. And you know what is very interesting? After all of the speech of the angel and all of the Numbers chapter 6 legal definitions of the Nazarite and the requirements over his life, yet it seems like the commandment in Samson resolved itself into one single word, almost like Adam in the garden. In the garden, Adam had one commandment. God says, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Adam had one commandment, one negative, to wrestle with. And in spite of all that's said in 21 verses about the Nazarite, it seems that Samson, for him, it all devolved into one simple word. You shall never have the locks of your hair cut. Samson does not find his secret in not touching grapes or being around vineyards. He does not find it in not touching dead bodies. That's out of the question. But it's one thing alone. And you know, for us, probably we have only one thing to wrestle with, and the Bible calls it our besetting sin. Do you know what is a mark of genius in the spiritual life? A mark of genius is to perceive the one thing that is needful and do that. I had an old professor tell me years ago, Professor Robert Gray, character, he was eccentric, physical culturist, lecturer in high school, strange character. He said to me, most people do 99 things and fail to do the one thing that is needful. It seems that our relationship to God resolves itself to a very sharp focus. And probably every person in, in here today, there is one thing that you have to wrestle with more than any other. And if you could overcome that, what a different person you would be. <clears throat> but my first moral lesson is, Samson failed to walk in the light. Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, in chapter number 14 and chapter number 15, down to verse number 8 of chapter 15, there is an episode where Samson went down to a place called Timnah or Timnoth and saw a Philistine woman and wanted her. and asked her, his parents to get that woman for him. For, he says in verse 3, she pleaseth me well. <clears throat> verse 4 says his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, and probably Samson didn't either. That the Lord, Yahweh, sought an occasion against the Philistines. And so there's an entire episode here of how Samson goes through the, the travail of getting this woman and all of the things that happened to him. And I just want to say that Timnah or Timnoth in Hebrew means portion or assigned portion. And I want to pose us the question today, when we go after a thing, when we have a goal, I don't care if it has to do with religious doctrines, uh, a so-called ministry gifts of the Spirit, a position in the church or the body of Christ. I don't care what it is. But we, when we envision a thing and we focus a thing and we begin to grasp a thing and we go after that thing, we must ask ourselves, yes, it's a portion, but whose portion is it? 
Samson went after her. He desired her personally. There's a whole history involved, and the upshot of it all is the Philistines came and burnt her with fire as a burnt offering unto the Lord. I say unto you, some things we go after are not our portion at all, but it is the Lord's portion. And I want to say this about what's wrong in the present hour, and there's something radically wrong, I'm, and I'm highly critical, and I don't care who knows it, and there's something radical wrong, radically wrong, and I want to begin to hint about what it is. It is because in our day, we have never learned how to give God all the glory. We saw something, we wanted it, we went after it, we, we grasped it, it was torn from our grasp, but some of it has remained with us. I, I feel an urge in this convention of the Spirit, I feel a movement, I feel the thought of God speaking to me in this wise, learn how to give everything to God. We need to learn how to give him everything, especially the glory. It must all go to God. I hope I can learn something from Samson's life and from the men that have inspired me who have been very much like Samson. That's a second moral lesson out of Samson's life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you praise the Lord? Praise our God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. We, had, we appreciate the shed blood of the covenant just now. <clears throat> let, me, let me bring out a few other things. I, I see something here in chapter 15, and then I want to end up by looking for evidences of grace in Samson's life. After Samson, uh, after the Philistines experienced great loss, <coughs> pardon me, and defeat from Samson at a certain point, and it tells us in chapter 15 and verse 8, uh, hey, he slew a lot of Philistines. In verse 8 it says, He went and dwelt in the top of the rock of Etom. And verse 9 says, Then the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. You see, in this present historical uh, scene of the great uh, drama of redemption, you have the great actor of the Philistine nations and the great actor of the Israelite nation, but you have a complicating factor. You have a character called Samson in whom God is free to act. God's free activity in Samson is a tremendous complicating factor in that neither the Philistines nor the Israelites know what's up. God knows, the Holy Ghost knows, and Samson is being used as a vessel. And let me say, all my life when I read about Samson, it is said by the theological uh, interpreters, the great European minds of Germany and England and France, that had Samson fully obeyed the Lord, he may have been the grandest character in all history. In other words, doing what he did and living the sloppy ethical life he did, he did all this much. How much might he have done had he lived a godly life like Moses or Samuel or, De or, or another one that we could name? And I have thought about Samson for years in ethical terms, and I'm not neglecting that. I'm not blind to it. But you know what is impressing me at this present moment? The thing that impresses me is that in spite of Samson, in spite of his fleshliness, in spite of all that offends us in our centuries of ethical development, in spite of what offends our Anglo-Saxon awareness, our, our Germanic kind of mind, I am impressed with the operation of the grace of God in Samson's life. I am not thinking so much today of Samson as of Samson's God. And now let's just take a look at uh, Israel, how they estimated this anointing. Philistines are in Judah and in Lehi. The men of Judah said to the Philistines, Where have you come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up. See, to bind an authentic Holy Ghost anointing is, requires the movement of armies. 
And don't tell me you got the real Holy Ghost and then the rotten state of the church has quenched you and you can't do anything, like Sister Queen Helen said last night, and Brother Roundtree said last night. If you get quenched, it's because you have sided with them and you've made a decision to be quenched. But if you won't be quenched, you'll burn your way through dungeons. <laughs> and when you deal with lions, we see two ways. Sam, Daniel had faith that the lion's mouths were stopped, but Samson had faith to tear them apart from the mouth. <laughs> So the, 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 the Israelites said to, <coughs> pardon me, to the, to the Judahites, we have come up to bind Samson and to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock of Etam. <laughs> 3,000 ecclesiastical experts went to deal with this deviating preacher. <laughs> we can't exonerate Samson, but you can't put the fire out either. The Schofield Bible notes sort of throw up their hands and say, Samson is an enigma. Well, he is to me too some, but I'm still getting something out of it that's not a total enigma. 3,000 men went and said, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? You see, they're not open to the Genesis word of dominion, but Samson is. <laughs> He's open to God. He's faulty, but he's open. They are uh, people of rectitude, but they're closed. I want to warn you about something. You can live the ethical to the hill and do it all right like a Pharisee and have no fire, anointing, power, or glory. I'm just cautioning you about that. Too much caution in life may cost us the ability to move freely in God. Samson did just what classical Catholic theology says not to. Classical Catholic theology says avoid the occasion of sin. But the purpose of God in Sam's life almost necessitated uh, being around defilement, and also his very killing of Philistines and a lion, the very dead bodies would have defiled him. And yet, God did not end his Nazarite vow or make it invul because the power kept operating. Let me say this, and Brother Jake Luffy was here a few weeks ago, just mentioned this in passing, and it caused something to ignite in my being. Reason demands that we believe that Samson was not a Nazarite after the order of the law. He was a Nazarite after the order of grace. Let me give you one final clincher. The, the Nazarite of Numbers chose to make the vow of his own free volition. God in heaven chose Samson's life and destiny and calling for him. I ask you in this moment, can you so accept the Bible picture of God as a loving father that you will ask God in prayer saying, choose thou for me, O Lord. Will you allow God to choose for you rather than you choose for you? Or do we love our plans so much that we must choose for ourselves and reject what the Lord would choose? You know, real faith is when you let the Lord choose for you and you let your choice go by. Choose thou for me, O Lord. The Lord has been telling me lately, it is better for me to be in Jesus' kingdom with a low position than for me to make my own kingdom and sit in the throne. I believe the kingdom builds of this world and of the church at the present hour need to be persuaded by biblical preaching and by Christ-centered preaching and by Holy Ghost revelation to quit building their kingdoms and to get out of their thrones and to dismantle the whole machinery and let the church of God be built as God would. I believe we need to hook a Holy Ghost bulldozer to some of the kings of the present hour and pull them out of their thrones. I believe we need to loose a, loose a mighty power through prayer and help them out of their thrones for their own good and for God's glory. Amen. It has been said that when the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world on the mountaintop, and I knew for years God, the, the, the devil showed him Egypt and Babylon and Greece and Rome and Ethiopia and all the great kingdoms and the kingdoms to come, such as... Uh, Russia and Germany and their military might and glory. But this commentator became penetrated and said the devil showed Jesus the Christian kingdoms 
And he rejected even them. We need to affirm only the kingdom of our Father in heaven and submit as Jesus himself submitted in the days of his flesh. Marks of grace in Samson's life. Chapter 14. The beginning of the chapter, I'm sorry. Chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Chapter 14. I praise the Lord today, saints. I praise the Lord today. God is real. His word is real. The Holy Ghost is real. The real church, the kingdom is real. There's much that's unreal, masquerading, but the real is real. Chapter 14 of Judges in verse 5. Then went Samson down and his father and mother to Timnah. He came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore him as he would have torn a kid. And Samson had nothing in his hand. I now believe power is more related to what we don't have than what we do have. Do you notice the specific personal instructions Jesus gives his disciples when he sends them out? He said, and when you go, don't take anything extra with you. Don't take two coats. Don't take a bag with money. Don't take extra shoes. He sends them with as little as possible. And you notice the mighty characters in the Bible. Moses, the burning bush, God said, What's, what do you have in your hand? He says, a rod. Uh, David approaching the battlefield with Goliath, he had the simple equipment of a shepherd. And he even had the script empty till he got to the scene. And he found his ammunition right at the battlefield. You don't even have to carry stones or pebbles for miles from some other place. You'll find your ammunition. And the sword he slew him with was in the giant's hand. Goliath himself brought his own death instrument. It says in that account, there was no sword in the hand of David. Hallelujah. And this is the best one of all. It says, and, there were, and he had nothing in his hand. It was all in his heart. Praise God. Evidences of grace in Samson's life. Let's look into chapter 15. Samson has just slain a thousand Philistines with a new jawbone of an ass. Again, a mighty exploit with little and simple. And that place was named the Ramoth, Ramoth Lehi, or the place of the jawbone, the hill of the jawbone. And the Bible says when he got done slaying a thousand Philistines, he was very thirsty. I noticed something last night as Brother Roundtree preached, something I never saw before. There's a unique relationship of Philistines and wells. And also, slaying Philistines makes you very thirsty, Brother Roundtree. <laughs> the Bible says, he was very thirsty in verse 18, and called on the Lord. Brother Maranti magnified learning to call upon the name of the Lord. And Samson said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. And God split a hollow place in the hill of the jawbone, Ramath Lehi, and there came water out of it, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof En Hakore, which means the well of him who cried, or the fountain of the calling one. And you notice that God opened that fountain by sheer grace, totally unmerited favor, with no work on Samson's part at all.
Hallelujah. Do you see it? Marks of grace. Now I'm going to give one final one. When Samson <clears throat> falls into the arms of Delilah, and by the way, Delilah mean that, means that which enfeebles, weakens, makes thin, brings low. She is the emaciator, the spiritual emaciator. Paul says in Corinthians, fleshly lusts war against the soul. And when he told his secret, and they cut off the locks of his head, and bored out his eyes, they put him in the prison like a beast. That the Bible says, let me see where it is, the hair of his head began to grow again. First of all, cutting hair actually stimulates the growth of hair. Secondly, and his hair represents his power, and when that hair is grown out, I see a revelation in Samson's life, which is a very, very general biblical one, is that grace is a restorer. How many are glad that grace restores? It's the end, his hair is cut off, everything is lost, his eyes are out. He'll never have a further revelation. He has been crystallized, he has been uh, finished historically. And yet, as the hair of his head grows, restoring grace works in his life. And he calls upon God one last time. And his last exploit is the greatest of his life. Hallelujah. Grace is a restorer. There is a perverse religiousness that makes us commit spiritual suicide. And after we have blown it, after we've lived a long time and shamed ourselves down, then we refuse to come to God and be restored. But my Father will restore you if you come back to Him. I, I serve the God who restores at the end when everything is shame and sin and failure and contradiction. He will restore you, hallelujah. Call upon His name one last time. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And I want to give one final little lesson. I want to talk about Jesus Christ, our perfect Nazarite. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whom they treated similarly, he found himself even in, in the very prison house of hell, as it were. But he allowed his blood to flow upon the pillars upon which this world is founded and shook down the entire carnal sinful system and made godly living. He brought, as the Bible writer says, life and immortality to light. And he did it in his death, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. But he's coming back again, and he's bringing Samson with him. You and I will see Samson, uh, what kind of a physique he had one time, and you're probably going to find a very thin fellow. Not quite like the assembly God preacher preached years ago. Four foot eleven, muscles the size of the kneecaps on a sparrow. But I tell you, whatever he was and whatever he had, it was of a nature that God could get the glory. <laughs> Let's go, let God have the glory. Praise God. Brother Tom, would you come and put a gracious period to this meeting? Hallelujah. We're in, we have read to you out of the Bible.